This is episode 317 of the Beyond the Food Show. And today we're taking a deep dive into exercise mindset to help us move our body with joy more frequently. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Going Beyond the Food Show. I'm Stephanie Dodier, clinical nutritionist and creator of the Going Beyond the Food Method. And after a 25-year dieting career that started at the age of 12, I decided to say hell no to diet culture and undiet my life. It is now my mission to help women undiet their life. If you're new to our podcast, be sure to grab our free podcast roadmap at stephaniedoze.com forward slash roadmap. Ready, sisters? Let's do this. And welcome back, my sister. So much has happened in our life and on Diet Your Life for the last week. And I want to bring you into that because there's something I want to share with you that I think is really important, or at least I believe it's really important and it can affect a lot of you. So number one, we launched the Confidence Bootcamp days ago. So March 1st was our very first live session and it was so good. Women came determined to do the work to reshape their mind and create unshakable confidence. And when I mean unshakable, meaning it's never going to be shaken by whatever your body looks, (laughs) however old you are, you're going to feel confidence. And these women came in to do this work. And it was so beautiful to watch. And one thing we talked about is creating emotional safety. And I wanted to kind of bring that conversation to your awareness because it's essential. In order for you to reshape how your brain operates, in order for you to be able to change the thoughts you think about yourself, about your body, the thought that creates stress, shame, anxiety, all the things that we feel about ourselves and our body that creates self-doubt, in order for us to be able to change these thoughts, we need to be in a space of emotional safety. And most of us women that have been impacted by via culture, we have been living with a brain that lives on default. What I mean by that is I want you to think of your brain like a toddler and a toddler that doesn't have parents. Your brain has been allowed to do crazy things and it's been allowed to do all the things that a toddler should not be doing. Your human brain has been allowed to roam free and to think thoughts that kept you or that are keeping you right now feeling stress, shame, and anxiety, or whatever the thing you feel, and living a limiting life. A life where you don't see your own possibility, a life where you're saying, well, I'm not sure, I don't know, once I do, or once I feel this way, or once I my body looks this way, then I'll allow myself to do that. That's what I call a limiting life. And that's what your brain has been producing on default because you never intentionally managed your mind or took control of that toddler, which is your human brain, in order for you to feed your brain with the thoughts that are going to create the life that you want. And the women in the Confident Bootcamp took that leap. They decided to say, no, (laughs) I'm going to take charge of my brain now. And I am going to reshape my brain so that I can create unshakable confidence. But in order to do that, they have to create emotional safety. Emotional safety is what I commonly refer to having your own back. Meaning that you are committing to yourself That no matter what happened, no matter how many mistakes you make, errors you make, how long it takes for you to achieve your goal, you will not beat yourself up. You will not treat yourself 
like crap in your own mind. You won't call yourself a failure. You won't punish yourself. You won't deprive yourself. You won't think of yourself as less than because you made an error, because you made a mistake, or because you've hit a roadblock. You have to commit to have your own back. You have to commit to take responsibility to create emotional safety for yourself, no matter what. Because if your human brain sees that as soon as there's a little glitch in the road, as soon as something doesn't go well, you turn around and create suffering for yourself by beating yourself up in your own mind, your toddler brain will not listen to you. And we, I say we, I don't have kids, but all of you mom know this, right? Operating with the fear of punishment for children doesn't work. And it's the same thing for your brain. We can't enter the space of creating confidence and reshaping our mind from a place of fear. Your brain will respond by not adopting the new intentional thoughts that you want to think about yourself. It will constantly revert back to default setting because it's constantly in a stress situation and in a fear that if it does one thing wrong, (laughs) you're going to beat the shit out of yourself. So one of the things we talked about in the first Confident Bootcamp is how we can create emotional safety for ourselves and how we can choose every time we have a decision to make to love ourselves, to make decisions from a place of love for ourselves instead of fear. And when we do that, that's how the reshaping, rewiring of our brain accelerate. And that's when the fast track to confidence can happen. When you know, no matter what, you're going to be emotionally safe, and you're going to have your own back. So you still have time to join us. If you want to be part of those conversations and learning how to create confidence for yourself, come and join us in Undiet Your Life. When you join Undiet Your Life, you get a full year of support from us. So we'll give you the recording for the boot camp week one. You can get cut up and then join us right away. I'm so freaking excited to see some of you from the podcast with us doing the work and creating confidence. Now, we're going to move to today's topic. <laughs> I've been talking a lot, but today's topic is about moving our body. And I've shared a lot about my personal journey with movement and the result is as of today, I have been working out twice a week, doing some functional training for more than a year now. And has been fun. And I did that because I changed the way that I was thinking about exercise. And I also hired myself a coach. Yes, I hired myself a coach so she can keep me focused on exercise that help my body get stronger. And because of that, I've had a lot of strength gain. I have a scoliosis and I've got different musculoskeletic issue in my body. And my God, I'm such a different person in my body today, a year later than I was a year ago. Because my coach kept me on the track for what was right for me. So I just, I'm a coach and I hire coaches because we all need that when we want to be successful somewhere. So Today, we're going to talk with one of my trainee, a professional who took our mentorship program, the non-diet approach to mentorship for professional. Her name is Jolene. She's a personal trainer and a core confidence specialist. So core confidence, she'll talk about it in the podcast, but it is, I don't want to advance myself in too much here, (laughs) specialty talk, but She has specific technique to help women in the pelvic area, which is very different from women to men. And she is a specialist of that area of the body. So she coaches exclusively women. So we're going to talk about five things that we can do to create more joy and move more our body. It's a very good conversation. And I think it's going to help many of you. Ready? Let's do this. Welcome to the show, Jolene. 
Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited and so honored. <laughs> I'm excited to be talking about the five step to change our exercise mindset because we're in the beginning of the year right now and people want to move their body more, not necessarily about weight loss, but they're having a huge difficulty. Mm -hmm. So let's walk through your approach to help your client change their mindset about exercise. Beautiful. Yeah. So one of the first things, and most of my clients who come to me for weight loss, even though they know I'm a, a non-diet trainer, oftentimes it's still forefront of the mind because of the culture we live in and the messages all around us saying that if you're thin, you'll be healthier, happier, all that stuff. So one of the first things I'll do is I'll ask my client to just for a time, let's put weight loss on the back burner. And the reason I do that is because if I say, okay, we're not going to do that right away. There's so much fear in weight loss that can almost stop the process. So when we say, let's put it on the back burner just for a little bit, that's how we can, can kind of start that journey. So that would be my number one tip is, is to just do that. Yeah. It opens people up to create a new way or a new reason for moving their body. Is that the goal here? Yeah, exactly. Because a lot of us come from a mindset that exercise is supposed to be punitive and that it's for losing weight and its purpose is for changing our body. And that's not anyone's fault, but culture right now, right? So being able to take that and just put that to the side for a moment, just so we can kind of discover the other steps that we're going to talk about. So finding ways that we can find movement that we enjoy that comes from a place more of self care. So let's talk about this whole back burner thing, right? Mm. Because you're saying like, let's put it on the back burner. Does that mean that we are saying, Oh, I'm not going to think about weight loss, but in six months from now, once I change my mindset, then I'm going to go to exercise for weight loss. Is that what you mean? That's a great question. So ultimately, no, the, <laughs> the idea is for a lot of women, weight loss is always going to be a part of their desire. And that's just because of the culture that we live in. So I want to recognize, I want to hold that space to recognize that and empathize with that. But the goal is not, let's figure out what you want to do. And then you can go back to losing weight. I don't teach weight loss. I came from a traditional conventional gym where, yeah, absolutely. Number one thing was transformation. So I came from that background. I do not teach it anymore. It's disempowering. And so the goal in all of these things is really to not come back to weight loss, to find movement that we enjoy that's empowering. So what I'm hearing you say is it's not about pause to the weight loss and exercise combination, but instead to create a new history, a new story around movement that does not include weight loss. Is that the idea here? You got it. Okay, perfect. Exactly. What's our next step? Okay, so step number two is, and what I find a lot of women, when they're used to seeing exercise as painful, punitive, like something that is a chore that they should be doing, they often will be disconnected. So I find one of the best steps is body awareness, coming back to our body. We've been so much in our head and our left side of the brain that we separate at the neck and often don't even know how to listen to our body's cues. So in the past, again, I'm just going to bring up this real quick. You might have heard me yelling, no pain, no gain, like with fitness, push yourself. You can do anything for 30 more seconds, a very push, right? Don't listen to your body, ignore it, press on. And the problem with this is that you learn to disconnect from your body. You're more prone to injury and you're more likely to see exercise as punishment. So what I have my clients do when they first start is we go through some connecting to our body work. So things like mindfulness, body scan, noticing your heart rate, any type of interoceptive awareness, even noticing hunger and fullness cues that can start the journey of body awareness. Yeah. So what you're suggesting we do is that we use our period where we move our body as an opportunity to reconnect with our body, to make the connection mind and body and to use that movement period as an opportunity to grow this capacity. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So give me a concrete example 
And let's say, I don't know, I'm walking. Okay. Like, give me a concrete example of somebody who's decided they're going to go for a walk twice a week. How can they practice connecting with their physical body while walking? Okay. So I'll start with one thing before I answer that question. Sometimes people need to take a break from moving their bodies all together. Okay. Sometimes, and this was especially true for one of my clients where she had such a punitive relationship with movement that she was going every day, had to be there for an hour. And I had suggested to her, like, why don't you just take a break for a minute and just see what that experience is like for you. And so for some people, they do need a space to not move their bodies because it's just been this relationship that's unhealthy, right? So that is one thing. And then from your angle, ways that you can be mindful while you're even moving, like walking is take the earbuds out for a little while, really come into your body. Like I know we're such a capitalist society of like, we need to get so many things done. You only do things for like- Be productive. Yeah, yeah. Slowing it down a bit, noticing your body when you're doing yoga, just coming into your body and noticing how things are moving, even just like gentle things, even washing the dishes, like noticing your body as Mm. your hands are in the warm water. Like there's a lot of just noticing little things. I'll give you an example for me. When I learned to connect my body, when I was moving, one of the things that I started to do is for, I don't know, two minutes while I was walking to focus on feeling the pressure on the pad of my foot. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Keeping the focus of like the right foot touching the ground, the left foot touching the ground, like from the heel to the pad of the foot and the heel to the pad of the foot and keep that focus as long as I could until something took my mind away from it. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, exactly. Awesome. So moving our body with the goal of connecting and feeling sensation in our body. That's exactly it. Yeah, exactly. So step three is about noticing the fears that we have. So this is, would be more outside of exercise, but maybe in a journaling kind of format or even just awareness. Oftentimes there's fears. Well, there's a fear of gaining weight. So basically what I do in my practice is I I try and guide my clients to come from a place of fear to love. So that's really my ultimate goal. And we've connected to our body now. Some of the deep fears that I notice that come up for clients are gaining weight and not being accepted. Mm -hmm. They want to work out, but they feel insecure at a gym because they don't know what they're doing or they don't know if they're doing it right. Some of the things is uh, a fear of getting hurt. And then another one, a big one is fear of being judged or feeling like they're not good enough. So coming back and noticing deep down underneath every person, there are fears and under every even like surface goal, there's emotion, right? So recognizing those fears, getting rid of all those shoulds, and then we can start to create new thoughts, thoughts that come from a place of love. We create new goals that are going to make you feel good in your body, goals that will make your life easier, goals that you look forward to accomplishing, right? That's one of the last steps, but we find the activities that we enjoy doing that will challenge us. Can I make one quick note on the whole uh, joyful Mm. movement aspect? So if you've been in the non-diet world for any amount of time, you probably have heard the term joyful movement and may have assumed that this means only doing what brings you complete joy. Yeah. So one thing I want to say on this is moving our bodies is great. Any movement is going to bring oxygen to the blood circulation, make us feel refreshed in our four bodies, but challenging ourselves through strength training and flexibility, mobility work, cardiovascular endurance, any type of functional movement, these are not always going to feel comfortable. So as much as I don't want you doing something you hate, there is a balance, right? So on one end, you can change your thoughts. So I'll give you an example. Personally, I don't love stretching. I could say I hate stretching and I feel dread doing it. Or I could say stretching helps my body feel better the next day after working out. And then I feel a lot more neutral knowing that it's coming from a place of self-care. And then on the other end, our joints need load to function well, right? So let's just say if someone who doesn't strength train and they trip and fall and they hurt their ankle, their recovery time is going to be a lot slower than someone who has prepared the joints and is going to have a much faster recovery, or they might get up like nothing happened, maybe just a little embarrassed or something, but (laughs) but generally with no physical consequence, right? So obviously I'm a huge proponent for strength training and mobility work for the purpose of activities of daily living. 
for accident prevention and, and for longevity. So yeah, I, I wanted to clear the air on that. I feel like there's a lot of confusion with movement. Obviously things like yoga and Tai Chi are all great options, but self-care can also be powerlifting and Zumba and rock climbing and anything that challenges you and is rewarding for you. So looking at our fears mm -hmm. around movement yeah. and seeing how we can reframe these fear from a place mm -hmm. of neutrality and respect towards our body. Mm -hmm. Would that be the angle we want to look at our fears? Yes, exactly. So fear is things like weight loss, perfectionism, approval from others, where movement from love is, it comes from a place of self-care, self-love, body neutrality, body acceptance, respect for self. So it's two different things. And mm -hmm. for so long, we've been focused on just like doing this for change. Oftentimes when people are dieting, they're also exercising. When they stop dieting, they stop exercising. Like it's like to go hand in hand, as we know. So finding movement that you enjoy doing, right? So that's actually step four is finding movement we enjoy doing. Yeah. Um, did you have anything more you wanted to ask on that or can I- No, 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 continue. Then? So that I think that's very important when we talk about fun and pleasure in movement, because that's mm -hmm. one thing that most of us have not or ever had with movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah, if you go to my episode at 14 on the Non-Diet Mom Show, I talk about- finding movement from reflecting back into your childhood. Mm. So there's actually a meditation I, I do on that episode. And the goal with finding movement you enjoy is to think back to those times when you weren't running around the soccer field thinking, look how many calories I'm burning. Look how I'm going to fit in my dress on Valentine's Day. Like there was a time before that when you moved your body for pure bliss, for mm. just the enjoyment. And so that meditation kind of brings you back to that state. And that's a really good thing to reflect on. So journaling, what kind of things do I enjoy doing? And that's really one of my favorite steps with my clients is to go to that place. And you can just see the smile going on their faces of like, oh, I remember this. And <laughs> so give me an example from your clients of when they did this exercise you have on your podcast, by the way, it's the non-diet mom podcast episode 14, give us a couple of examples of what your client found as joyful movement choices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of my clients was gymnastics, something that it seems like as soon as you become an adult, you can't do gymnastics anymore, but that's just not true. <laughs> and so well, that was one for her. And soccer was actually one of the examples too. And running around the splash pads. How many adults do you see running around a splash pad? How many adults actually want to be? But yeah, little things like that. I think it's because diet culture and the coupling of exercise with weight loss made exercise so, I don't want to say hard, but complicated and exhaustive that we don't even think about having fun while moving our body. So that's a completely mm. different perspective that we're going to have to integrate and put effort into doing. Yeah, I know. And even gyms that say like so much fun that you'll forget your burning calories, stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, there's still dread and we know it's an actually anti-motivating to have that as their number one reason to exercise. So it's, yeah, it's true. It takes a process for sure. Yeah. What's our next step? Yeah. So the fifth and final step is making goals that are related to movement coming from that place of self-care and love. Mm. So you've gone through these, you've started to see the things you reflected on, things that you saw enjoyment in, and now we're going into, so how can I apply that to my life today? Right. So how can we find things that are going to make us feel good in our bodies? How are we going to find things that make my life easier day to day based right? things like that? So we can be really specific. Do we want to feel more energized? Do we want to feel less winded walking around the block and then finding goals that we can measure? And another part of that is community is a big part that helps with this specific goal related is having some kind of a community behind you to help you with those goals, supportive. That makes a big difference. I've seen in a lot of the ladies coming to my classes. So I do virtual classes, but we have a time at the end where we connect and we mm. always share wins. So wins from the workout, wins from the day. 
And I just this past week actually had someone say, I'm so thankful for this community. I'm so thankful that in the virtual world, it's so hard to have connection. But having that just connect time at the end where we can share our goals, share like share our accomplishment. The one lady was saying the one time that she'd worked out with me all winter long and I do strength classes and full body movement. And she went onto her bicycle that summer and she was like, I'm normally huffing and puffing, riding my bike the first time I'm on it in the summertime. But this year I just was flying down. My kids couldn't believe it. <laughs> oh, I loved it. That's when we can start seeing. That's a big shift, actually seeing movement from a shaping our body to movement, taking care of our body. Yeah. Right. That's a huge stuff. I know for me, I have hired a trainer. It's been a year now and we're only focused on functional movement, right? Movement for the function of my body, right? Mm. So that my body can be functional efficiently for a long time. Love it. Yeah, that's necessary. So there's two types of goals. There's functional training and then there's performance training. Functional training, not every trainer would agree on this, but I believe functional training is of most importance first because for performance training, you could do as many bicep curls as you want, but if you're not also working the legs, then yeah. You know, but yeah, so that's why I do a big. So what's on. performance training? So performative training would be building strength for like a specific muscle. It would be more like kind of body sculpting goal. So that could be another thing, but performance could also be running a 5k stuff like that. So again, like I said, I believe that you need to have a foundation of functional movement for you to do any type of performance goal anyway, but yeah. It's true because I don't know a lot about movement, but that's what I did before. So all my years of coupling movement with weight loss was about performative. Mm -hmm. And I can remember about a four year period of my life where I did bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. Right. And I was able to squat like huge number and like lift, like do bicep curls, a huge number. And when I started with my trainer now, fast forward five years, I was in terrible functional condition because I had overgrown yeah. muscles in some places, mm -hmm. but the tiny muscle for the joint to move efficiently was in terrible condition. Yeah. And it's like every day, if we're only using the same muscles, we get out of bed, we go to our computer, we do our work. If we're only ever using those muscles, then everything else is weak, really. Yeah. And so having that variety, having lopsided arms as we're walking, because when you're day to day, you're holding groceries, one bag's going to be heavier than the other. It's we're training for everyday living. And that's what we do in my group classes. There's a lot of moms. And so I sometimes will think from a mom's perspective, I'll be like, OK, so today we're going to fill our because we're working with what equipment people have. So yeah. We're going to fill a laundry basket with some textbooks and some paint cans, maybe a vinegar bottle. And we're going to do some deep squats with a proper form. And we're going to bring it down in an awkward way on purpose, <laughs> just so that we can train our body for reality, for real life. Yeah. And especially for moms, like you always have a kid on the hip <laughs> and you're yeah. lopsided all the time, right? So if you yes. don't specifically think of your exercise to rebalance your body. And I, I have seen that when I was in clinic, a lot of lopsided hip with mom because they carried for years, a child on one side instead of the other. Is that? Absolutely. It's so true. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So let's recap those five steps to change our mindset around exercise. If you can. Yeah. Yeah. So the number one thing I always say, throw out that scale, smash it down yeah. the window. No, <laughs> just kidding. But that's empowering for you to do that. But no, number one would be putting weight loss on the back burner. And like we discussed in the beginning, that doesn't mean that they're going to magically disappear. For a lot of women, that'll always be part of the desire. But we have ways to manage those thoughts around it. Number two would be connecting to the body. So coming back into our body, we were born intuitive and we've really disconnected over the years. Number three, being noticing the fear, becoming aware. That's more of a, the journaling aspect of it. Number four, finding movement that you enjoy. So nostalgia, coming back to that childhood or even like high school years when you did movement that you enjoyed. And then the final one, making goals that are related to fitness, coming from that place of self-care and love. Yeah. Amazing. So what's your approach? Or how do you help people with that? How can people 
work with you to implement those five steps into their life. Beautiful. Yeah. So right now I run virtual fitness classes three times a week. So we do Monday morning movement. It's a more gentle non-equipment approach. This is Eastern standard time at the moment. And uh, that's 6 30 in the morning. And then Tuesday, Thursday nights, we'll be back and forth, do full body and then strength training using equipment from our own homes. So right now group classes, I do one-on-one training and then, yeah, that's the main so people can hire classes. you for one-on-one training. Yeah, it's virtual. Yeah. Currently I have a client in Australia <laughs> who, you know, actually, Stephanie, <laughs> I think you know who I'm talking about. Yeah. 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 So Jewel, cause there's a lot of women looking for personal trainer in the non-diet approach and they are rare. Mm -hmm. So you're one of those people that we can hire. Oh yeah, definitely. Virtual Mm -hmm. one-on-one training in the non-diet approach. Like this is golden. If you're looking for someone, (laughs) you found one of those now. Yay. Yes, 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 yes. That's and what that. else then, um, you specialize in helping moms as well, mom coaching particularly, right? Yes. Yeah. So one of my biggest passions is helping moms with their relationship with movement, but also body image and nutrition, especially because we have little mouths to feed and there's a lot of pressure on moms. So moms stand out to me because of the societal pressure. So yeah, I guide my my clients to, to feel empowered in their bodies. And, and so I have a 12 week coaching program for moms called Nourish Moms Healthy Kids. And yeah, I take you through a few processes through that. That's amazing because as a mom, I've heard many times women say like, yeah, I'm doing this intuitive eating for me, but I got to figure out how to do it for my whole family as well, because Mm. stereotypical mom take care of the food in the house. So your program would help them with that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing is when we as moms can find that body trust and find that self-compassion in our motherhood and find body confidence, we are naturally going to raise competent eater, body confident kids. Like they're going to follow in our footsteps. They're going to respect the way that we do things. Nothing, you know, pains me more than me seeing a mother looking in the mirror and then critiquing or speaking poorly about themselves or being on every diet, trying to stay thin. And then they say to their daughters, oh, you're perfect the way you are. But the message they're actually hearing is the behavior. And that's when I get older, I'm going to hate my body. I'm going to try and I'm going to be losing weight. I'm going to be trying to fix my face. Like aging is a bad thing. So we really learn that our bodies are important when really that's just a very highly profitable lie as we know. Right. So Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I do have a a real heart for moms. I'm a mom myself. I have two little ones. We always coach where our lived experience resides, right? Yes, exactly. We are our own client. (laughs) Yes. Well, this was amazing specifically now that we're recording this in the early part of the year. I think it's going to help a lot of women and you offer services that can help women Mm -hmm. put this into action. So this was a a fantastic interview. Thank you very much, Jolene. Thank you so much. It was such an honor to be on your show today. Be on ready to shed diet culture from your life and become the expert at your own body. Awesome. Then you need to join on Diet Your Life program. Go to stephaniedodzie.com forward slash join and join us now. On Diet Your Life is the first program of its kind with the unique combination of mindset, life coaching with intuitive eating and body image. Find your freedom, reclaim your power, and take control of your time so you can refocus on what really matter to you. Join Undiet Your Life at stephaniedoze.com forward slash join, and I'll see you on the other side.